Like I said, on the count of three. One. Two. Three. When I think of one of the most influential comedians in Hollywood throughout the 20th century, I cannot help but think of Gene Wilder. Not because he's made the biggest Oscar-worthy movies, but more so because of one of his most iconic roles as Willy Wonka in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. After all, the movie was extremely colorful and fun as well as presenting a fun and exciting subject, even though some of it was pretty strange. But watching it as a child made me quickly realize that Wilder wasn't just an amazing performer, he was also a unique voice on screen. He rose to fame in a time when somebody with his quirky physique and curly hair was not common at all. Yet his comedic performances led audiences to hysterical laughter, but also showed great versatility as an actor, being able to be just as compelling in his dramatic characters. Throughout the years, Wilder had a unique career ranging from actor, writer, and even a filmmaker directing a handful of titles in the 1970s and 80s. In his later years, Wilder wrote several books, including a collection of short stories and a memoir. Knowing all of that, who is Gene Wilder? Gene Wilder's real name is Jerome Silberman, and he was born on June 11, 1933, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and he passed away on August 29, 2016. He chose the stage name Gene Wilder as a reference to dramatist Thornton Wilder, who wrote the play Our Town. Wilder began his career on the stage and made his screen debut in an episode of the TV series The Play of the Week in 1961. After dipping his toes into film, Wilder went back to the theater and was cast in the 1963 production of Mother Courage and Her Children. This production starred Annie Bancroft, who introduced Wilder to her boyfriend and later husband, Mel Brooks. A few months later, Brooks mentioned that he was working on a screenplay called Springtime for Hitler, which he thought Gene Wilder would be perfect in the role of Leo Bloom. Months and years went by where he didn't really hear from Mel Brooks, so well, he continued touring as a stage performer and even was cast for a televised production of Death of a Salesman, which led to a minor role as a hostage in the 1967 film Bonnie and Clyde. After three years of not hearing from Brooks, Wilder was called for a reading with Zero Mistel, who was to be the star of Springtime for Hitler, which eventually got renamed The Producers. And Mistel had approval of his co-star. Well, Wilder did get approved, and he was cast for his first leading role in the feature film, The Producers. The Producers eventually became a cult comedy classic and tells the story of Max Bialystok, played by Zero Mostel, who was once one of the most popular producers in Hollywood, but is now an aging, fragile, and greedy Broadway producer who romances wealthy elderly women in exchange for cash contribution. Max's new accountant, Leo Bloom, played by Gene Wilder, convinces Max to create the worst play possible entitled Springtime for Hitler, which would allow them to oversell shares on a massive scale and produce a play that will close on opening night. The play opens with a lavish production of the title song, which initially horrifies the audience but quickly becomes a smash hit after an accident on stage where the actor portraying Hitler goes and confronts the audience. This movie led Mel Brooks to winning an Academy Award for Best Original Screenplay and Wilder being nominated for Best Supporting Actor. In 1969, Wilder relocated to Paris accepting a lead role in Start the Revolution With Me, which is a comedy that is set in France during the French Revolution where two sets of twins are accidentally switched at birth. One set is aristocratic, while the other set is poor and dimwitted. On the eve of the French Revolution, both sets find themselves entangled in palace intrigues. After shooting ended, Wilder returned to New York where he read the script for Cracks Her Fortune Has a Cousin in the Bronx, which tells the story of a working class family in Dublin who has been unsuccessful in convincing their son to get a real job. The son is a horse dunk scooper and selling it for flower gardens. After being almost run over by a female American exchange student, they start a friendship and he falls head over heels over her. Being stubbornly in love with his job, he completely ignores signs that horses will soon be banned in the city of Dublin. Once that law goes into effect, work gets scarce. Dreaming of finding hope in a better life, he wants to leave for America. In 1971, 
Wilder auditioned to play Willy Wonka in Mel Stewart's film adaptation of Roald Dahl's Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. This is really my favorite Gene Wilder movie and has a big place in my heart. Maybe it's because I saw it as a child, but from that moment on I've always been a big fan of Wilder. The design of Wonka's factory has such unusual spaces and features that it is an absurd and surreal place that plays to the cinematic form in a way that not many other movies do. This is enhanced by the wonderful music score which includes songs such as Candyman and the timeless pure imagination. And we can't forget that many Oompa Loompa skits featured throughout the film. This movie tells the story of Charlie, a young boy from a poor family who dreams of finding one of five golden tickets hidden inside chocolate wrappers. After finding a golden ticket, he gets admitted inside the magical factory of the reclusive Willy Wonka. Four other children who have each their peculiarities and flaws find tickets too and go on a grand tour of the factory with Willy Wonka as a tour guide. Once inside, many supernatural things happen. Willy Wonka is a children's movie, but there are many dark elements to this movie, including Wilder's portrayal of Wonka as a sinister figure bellied by his confections and goody outfit. The movie has a mean spiritedness to it, but that's matched by a sense of justice. Willy Wonka was not a big success on its opening weekend, although it received positive reviews from critics and did gain enormous popularity with time. Because the first three movies that Gene Wilder appeared in were not box office successes, when Woody Allen offered Wilder to appear in his movie Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Sex, but were too afraid to ask, he accepted hoping that this would be the hit that would end his series of flops. This movie was inspired by the book written by David Rubin and tackles seven questions about sex by connecting seven not-so-connected stories. Gene Wilder plays a doctor in one of these stories where a man comes to his cabinet and wants his help because he has fallen in love with his sheep and she has left him. <laughs> yes, this movie is a comedy just from the premise of the subject and it was a hit upon its release grossing 18 million alone in the USA against a 2 million dollar budget. This success led to more acting gigs including a TV movie called Acts of Love and other comedies and another movie alongside Zero Mostel called Rhinoceros where a young man Gene Wilder in love with his co-worker finds that everyone around him, even his condescending best friend, is changing into a rhinoceros. This was an enjoyable movie but I want to focus more on the movie that followed this one which is the timeless western classic Blazing Saddles, directed by Mel Brooks. Gene Wilder got the role of the wacko kid when Mel Brooks urgently called him saying that Dan Daly had just dropped out of the film at the last minute and he needed someone to replace him. Wilder at the time was about to start filming another movie entitled The Little Prince. Wanting to do both films, he flew quickly back to America to shoot his scenes for Blazing Saddles and immediately went back to London to film The Little Prince. This was a great decision from his part as this created yet another classic under Wilder's belt, even though critics were mixed upon its original release. This movie is a spoof of the western genre and especially the racism of Hollywood movies. Blazing Saddles tells the story of an African American who assumes the post of sheriff in a western frontier town called Rock Ridge. Initially the people of this town harbor racial bias towards their new leader. However they warm to him after realizing that his perpetually drunk gunfighter friend, played by Gene Wilder, are the only defense against a wave of thugs sent to rid the town of its population. The message of this film was extremely potent at the time, and after an in-studio screening, some Warner Brothers executives debated whether this movie should be released or not. Obviously the movie was released as I am able to speak about it, and I'm glad it was as it's a movie that still resonates for its important racial message and of course hilarious satirical humor. A couple of years prior to shooting Blazing Saddles, Gene Wilder had began working on a script called Young Frankenstein. After writing a two-page scenario, he called his good old friend Mel Brooks who told him that it seemed like a cute idea but showed little interest. A few months later, Wilder's agent called him asking if he had anything where he could include Peter Boyle and Marty Feldman, his two new clients. Having just seen Feldman on television, Wilder was inspired to write a scene that takes place at the Transylvania station where Igor and Frederick meet for the first time. The scene was later included in the film almost verbatim. His agent loved the idea, called Brooks asking him to direct. Brooks was still not convinced. 
but having spent four years working on two box office failures, he decided to accept. Young Frankenstein tells the story of respected medical lecturer Dr. Frederick Frankenstein, played by Gene Wilder, who learns that he has inherited his infamous grandfather's estate in Transylvania. Arriving at the castle, Dr. Frankenstein soon begins to recreate his grandfather's experiments with the help of servant Igor, Inga, and the fearsome Frau Blücher. After he creates his own monster, new complications ensue with the arrival of the doctor's fiancée, Elizabeth. The humor of this movie was quite loony, with a modern deep pan delivery to most of the jokes. The quality of Young Frankenstein was due to a variety of factors, but Gene Wilder's creative influence was certainly one of them. This movie was a success, with Wilder and Brooks receiving Best Adapted Screenplay nominations at the 1974 Oscars. Even Brooks says that even though he thinks that Blazing Saddles was his funniest movie, Young Frankenstein is his best movie. Well, this concludes the first part of my retrospective on Gene Wilder. In the second video, I will focus on the second part of his career from the mid-1970s throughout the 80s. I really hope that you guys enjoyed this video. Please be sure to subscribe and hit the like button. Leave me a comment too if you'd like to share one of your favorite Gene Wilder moments. I'd love to hear what they are. Have a great day, and I'll see you in the next video.